the um, we'll, we'll adjourn when we get there. Um, so we're another step along the way towards the 2016 budget, and it's my job tonight to offer it to the public. Um, it's on the website. It went up uh, yet last night, as Watson points out, sometime between 4:30 and 6, and the complete um, have discussion that I'm offering is also available on the website, and I have some abbreviated comments tonight. Um, just to kind of take you into a little bit. Um, they're not so much inside baseball as outside baseball as far as uh, the overall picture. And then there will be a process that we'll go through to get to a final budget by November. But first let me just say um, thanks for coming. Um, it's one of the most important things we do during the year, and certainly in my job description, is to make sure the town residents are getting the services they need. Um, even though, to quote the amazing Yogi Berra, maybe rest in peace, a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. I'm presenting the tentative budget. Uh, final budget adoption will take place in mid-November by majority vote. Following a public hearing on November 4th, which I hope everybody will come out for. So here are a few highlights from the document which is available in its entirety on the town's website. Um, first of all, I want to thank... Do you have, I'm, I'm sorry, do you have a write-up to give each of us? I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, every piece of information I got as soon as I have a chance to, to get back to okay. and me, email it out or give you copies or whatever. Um, I do want to give uh, recognition to our town employees, our department heads, um, for the work they put in, uh, working on the budget and running the town. And also to our finance team with Jeff, um, Janice Ganley, Natalie, really do a great job. And it is a painstaking and, 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 and extremely, um, it, it's really a huge undertaking. Um, we've had a great help from Deputy Supervisor Alan Riff, my assistant Elijah Reichman Melnick. We've gone through this budget line by line and we've really, we've really delivered, I think, a product that, that this town board and the town um, we're really setting the table for having an excellent budget for 2016. So I just want to give you guys thanks. Jeff, you're sitting in for the rest of the finance team here tonight. Really did a great job. Um, we have to recognize that in Rockland we do pay among the highest taxes in the country. And I think this proposed budget strikes a balance, the right balance, between funding essential services, keeping enough police officers on the street, plugging the leaks in the sewer system, keeping our parks going, on the one hand, and controlling costs. And there are very, very tough decisions that are embedded in the budget and that we need to deal with in running this town. I do look forward to working with the rest of the town board, um, as I always do, to welcome and respect valuable input, fact-based and, and, and interested input, and I expect to get it. Um, and as long as the net impact of any changes um, doesn't put us over the tax cap or jeopardize an essential service, then I will support it. And so I thank you ahead of time for whatever suggestions or, or uh, revisions um, we can work out together. So let's talk about the bottom line. Um, the proposed budget for 2016 is under the New York State cap, uh, tax cap, as have been my last few proposals. Um, and the town has been under the cap for the last uh, four years, I think. The budget reduces the overall tax burden. It's the third year in a row that we've been under the tax cap. and. I'm looking forward for four years or whatever, go, go back a few years. Um, and I think that's a really important accomplishment. And I don't know if uh, going back four or five years, people really thought it was possible. Um, this time around, um, we're looking at about $100,000 in uh, decreased actual expenses and spending. And uh, in short, it is inefficient, it is physically, fiscally conservative, and it does minimize the burden on residents while making sure that we have the heavy equipment and the materials we need for safe roads, and we have um, the other services intact. Um, so overall, you know, there are serious fiscal issues at the federal, state level, certainly at the county level. Um, the town of Orangetown is really doing very well. Our overall reserves are increasing. Our, um, you know, our overall town debt is decreasing. We have an excellent AA2 bond rating from Moody's, and. Um, I think that our work has, has paid off. A note on the things that drive up the costs that we have to deal with, right? Um, and one of them is personnel expenses. The increasing costs of personnel in terms of health care and, and so on 
um, are really a challenge for the town. It's a, it's a trend where over time, more and more of the town budget is basically salary and benefits and so on. And there's less and less left over for the other things. The people who work for the town need to do their jobs. Um, you know, the materials, the equipment, the fuel, and so on and so forth. And it's a trend that's, that's, that's not sustainable. Um, and in my view, and I'll say this directly to Ronnie since you're sitting here, um, we're at minimum staffing. I don't think this town can police itself with fewer than 83 police officers. Um, I think that, that we're basically running about as lean as it's possible to go. And at the same time, I think our taxpayers are maxed out. I think they're at the maximum tolerance for tax paying. And that is the predicament in which we find ourselves. And certainly meaning re meaningful reform and mandated costs at the state level will provide some relief and we'll continue to, to, to work on that. Um, although that is more the bailiwick of Albany. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the work we do to cut costs, to get grants and to find new revenues, get gobbled up by mandated tax givebacks to big companies and the mandatory cost increases. And here I am talking about Pfizer's drastic downsizing, which alone has obligated the town to refund over $7 million in the last four years. That's a lot of money. That's a big burden for our budget to, co to cover and continue to fund the things we need. Um, we're in for another $1.8 million this coming year. There's a large tax cert over at Blue Hill Plaza, which adds to the pain. Were it not for these tax certiorari payments, which are almost $9 million since 2012, we could probably have achieved what many people would consider to be impossible, which is an actual reduction in taxes in many of those years. Instead, we've been hard pressed just to keep the budget flat. Fortunately, um, the Pfizer deal is uh, no more than a year over, and it looks to me like with IRG and the Nanuet School District, um, they're poised to have a buyer, and with any luck, they'll succeed in their goal of bringing new businesses into that site. Businesses like Protein Sciences, which is a vaccine flu vaccine manufacturer that's growing and doing great. Um, I oppose chemical manufacturing, have done so for since the beginning of our awareness of what Anelotech was about in terms of its expansion plans, and that includes waste gasification. And, and the, the wonderful thing is that we can be opposed to that and we can ban that, and there are many, many businesses that want to work in Orange Town and want to develop here, and we've had some great luck. So the questions, for, for example, we've got a cluster of data centers, we've got hotels, um, and one of the great examples recently is Celtic Sheet Metal, which is a great company, a very high union wage paying company that manufactures um, HVAC ductwork for skyscrapers. Um, they wanted a zone change to put a, a, a uh, light industrial facility in a residential area on, Blauvelt, on Route 303 in Blauvelt. We stood firm against that because we value our zoning. Um, and they bought the Olympus building on Corporate Drive, which nobody's been in for years. And it's fabulous that they're in there now. Actually, they're renting it out to movie companies and making a lot of money on that. Um, that kind of business growth takes the burden off residents, and that's what we're looking to promote. So how are we saving some money? Well, there's, there's so many lines in that budget, and so many of them have been reduced in different ways, modestly, based on looking at the average use over the last four or five years. Um, I just want to list a couple of examples of, of some sort of new stuff. One is that earlier this year, I got the town board to agree that we commission specialized auditors to go after our franchise agreements, specifically Cablevision and Verizon, because um, you have to do that once in a while to make sure they're not taking advantage of you. And it turns out that Cablevision owes us about $150,000. And going forward, when that's corrected and, and recouped, we'll be getting an extra $25,000 a year. So we can, we can do some things to bring in some more money and make sure that we're not leaving money on the table. Um, our load shedding agreement, for example, with the sewer department, and Joe is here, and the engineers have worked on that. Um, we finally got an agreement figured out, and that brings in roughly $100,000 a year, simply giving the utility companies the right occasionally to ask that the town run its backup generators to help them when the grid is overstressed because of a heat wave and everybody having the air conditioners on. So that's something that we're doing. It earns us money. It helps out the community because you're less likely to have a brownout or something, and it it also obviates the need for the utilities to go build a whole new power plant somewhere because they can basically manage peak demand. We've written a lot of grants. Um, we've gotten a good deal of money. Uh, I think we added it up. It came to almost $5 million when you count the sewage sled press, the, uh, the sidewalks on Middletown Road, and so on and so forth, the bridge in Japan. So having an aggressive grant writing program has certainly helped. 
one of the biggest parts of our budget, besides operational, is essentially your investment in capital facilities, your heavy equipment and your buildings and roads and so on. And we have a bond list that the town board will have to review. And we reviewed it, and essentially by identifying the things that seem to be most urgent and most important, set a number for where we think the bond should be. And then from that number, pulled out what the debt service obligation would be and put that in the budget where it needs to be. And so it's very important to invest for the long term in this town in things like um, police cars and in our highways, parks, the IT department's ability to, to safely store our, our critical data off-site and have a disaster recovery plan. Um, these are the things that are in there. Um, parking lots in Veterans Park, tennis court, fences that have become unsafe, irrigation systems. Um, getting the police department on, on the, the new kind of phones, which takes a little money up front, but saves you a lot of money in the long run, as we've seen with the rest of the town. Um, these things are in the capital list, and that needs to be reviewed by the town board members. And of course, the overall number agreed to, and then the specific items agreed to, uh, or changed as the case may arise. It's worth emphasizing two things about this bond. First of all, that it's only for stuff that we really, really need. It's not a blank check. Uh, we carefully scrutinized all the requests from every department. And second, and most importantly, the town's overall indebtedness is decreasing. We're issuing every year between a little over three million and paying off of around four. So year after year, we're actually building our capacity to use bonds if we need them. Let's talk a little bit about Blue Hill because I think that is kind of the lightning rod issue for this budget. And, um, and we've talked about it before, and we're gonna have to talk about it more. It's one town program where the status quo is not working financially, although we can certainly recognize and celebrate the fact that it works great as a beautiful golf course with, with, with a successful business partnership for the most part and, and wonderful maintenance. Um, it's a beautiful place. Uh, financially, it averages annually, if you look over the last four or five years, about $600,000 of losses. Over the many years that's been going on, it basically has an IOU note to our general fund of about three and a half million dollars. This is basically the one dark cloud on what is otherwise a sunny picture, more or less, for the town's budget and its financial picture. And our independent auditors remind us year after year that that is the issue we have to deal with, and it is very definitely time to act. We have solved a very similar situation over Broadacres by hiring Applied Golf to run the course. Councilman Valentine and Moore joined me in authorizing this contract, and over the last two golf seasons, revenues at Broadacres are up by 5% per this year, more or less. How much are they Town, at Blue Hill? They've been they're up by about 1% at Blue Hill. So comparatively speaking, that deal's working very well. Both golf courses get the same weather. Are they gonna, get, uh, are they gonna meet their number? The, I'm not, we'll get into the details no, of it. Um, but the course, which was losing an average of $400,000 a year, is getting closer to breaking even, and most importantly, golfers report that it looks better than ever. Um, we cannot shy away from the imperative that we, that we look at that success and turn our eyes towards Blue Hill. Earlier this year, the town board voted unanimously to issue a request for proposal for management of Blue Hill. The RFP was for the restaurant and the pro shop, which have long been operated by local businesses on short-term contracts, owned by the town, operated by local businesses. We also solicited proposals for golf course maintenance, an item that had been considered, I understand, in years past, um, but it was something that needed to be included this time as well. That work is currently performed by eight town employees. Some of these employees are close to retirement. All of them are entitled to other town jobs because they have seniority, and we do have a labor agreement, and that is their right. Good jobs, Jim. We have several excellent responses to the RFP in hand, and have been analyzing them going back to them, extracting the data they don't always provide, and making sure we can provide a very clear comparative analysis of where the best deal lies for the town so the town board and the public can review it. These prospective business partners will be presented to the town board on October 6th at our meeting, and there will be interviews and negotiations, and there are multiple kinds of management contracts that are being proposed, and we need to look at all of them and sort it out. Because the status quo of Blue Hill is absolutely unacceptable, and because we have excellent responses to our request for proposal, and because we've seen 
new management work at Broad Acres, my budget plans for savings at Blue Hill that are conservatively estimated. They're not the maximum you know, hoped for savings. They're savings that are based on the actual pitches that companies are making. This is how much you'd have to pay us and comparing that to how much it costs to run the place now. Um, with this plan, Blue Hill will stop hemorrhaging money and will begin to repay its accumulated three and a half million dollars debt to the general fund. And let me remind us all that that debt really matters. That's money that we don't have for playgrounds or police cars or highway equipment. It is no joke and it is something that our taxpayers and anybody who lives in this town needs to see us act on. And we are very definitely in a position to have a contract which makes sense for the town and to do it before the end of this year or even before the closure of this budgeting process and get that done. Before moving on, I want to make th one thing very, very clear is that neither I nor anyone else I've talked to has any desire to sell Blue Hill or privatize it in that sense. All that is being discussed is the prospect of a three-year contract by a private company to manage the daily maintenance and running the pro shop and the restaurant or whatever combination of companies and partnerships works best. That's what's being proposed, not the sale of the land or something like that. To be acceptable, in my view anyway, any change at Blue Hill has to save us money and it has to preserve the course as a public asset, a place that we love, a place that even the people who don't golf at can drive by and look at with pride and know that it contributes to their property values, open space, and their quality of life. I think we can and we must accomplish both of these goals. And we're going to have to go through those spreadsheets and compare each of the ideas, and we're going to have to look at the bumping rates that town employees have, which are plentiful, and see where it goes. Um, every month, this town sees retirements, um, vacancies that are funded in the sewer department, for example, in the parks department right now. Um, it's entirely likely that if the town board elects to go through with some sort of management contract for the maintenance part of Blue Hill, that no town employees will be laid off. It's also possible if the timing isn't right and the retirement isn't there and the funded vacancy isn't available, that someone will get laid off. And that is our job as people who, who make this budget and run this town to deal with and strike the balance. Um, but last time I checked, you know, town government is something that, that is paid for with tax dollars and it is not designed only to put people to work. It puts people to work for very specific purposes that are super important. Uh, just a note on fund balance. Um, we're using fund balance this time around, as we have in past years. And it's a number that's more or less in between the fund balance allocated from past years. In other words, it's a judicious amount of fund balance. The fund balance overall in this town is doing quite well and actually increasing a little bit. And usually, in fact, every single year um, that I've been involved, we budget for use of fund balance between one and three million dollars. And then by the end of the year, we work so hard, uh, or maybe there's been some retirements for various reasons, we don't use the full amount that we budgeted for. So that's the way it's been in the past, and I think that's the way it's gonna be in the future. And overall, our reserve funds are at a healthy 35%, which is, which is pretty good. And there's, of course, you've got the assigned and the unassigned reserved, and you can kind of drill down into that data. But the bottom line is, we need to use some fund balance. These are dollars that taxpayers took out of their pocket and paid for services, and, and you know, it's, it's a good thing to use those dollars when you can instead of going back to their pockets for more dollars. So in conclusion, there's many large and small decisions in this budget and there's a lot of work to do. Over the coming weeks, I welcome the feedback and ideas from Orange Town taxpayers and from my colleagues on the town board. For me, the bottom line is that our final budget must do what the taxpayers in this town demand. It must hold the line on town spending, preserve public services we enjoy, and most importantly, it must stay under the tax cap. If we do these three things, we can produce a final budget that works for the residents of this town and one that we can all be proud of and defend uh, even in the face of tough decisions and debate. So that, in a nutshell, is the, is the overarching financial picture